traveling stranger Traveling through this world of woe There's no sickness, no thought of danger That bright world is what I know
God, I pray that you'd save them before it's everlasting too late. And Lord, for those of us who are saved, God, I pray you'd teach us. Teach us to pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, uh, we're continuing this study on the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, last week we began this sixth chapter and we saw that there were two things that, that Jesus started out talking about that should be done in secret. We talked about giving, we talked about prayer. And as we move on in this uh, Sermon on the Mount, we, we also mentioned that uh, it, there's one thing that the disciples desire above everything else that they ever uh, talked to Jesus about. They, they came asking, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. In other words, uh, teach us how we can do that. Teach us uh, the way that you would have us to pray. And then we find here in the Sermon on the Mount, he does that same thing here. He teaches them not the, the discipline which we looked at last week, but he teaches them the manner, the how-to of spiritual prayer. And he talks about uh, also another matter that uh, that should be done in secret as he ends this sixth chapter, or as he ends this part of the sixth chapter, he ends it with something about uh, the secret concerning spiritual matter, which is fasting. This this third thing that should be done in secret. And so as we come here uh, last week, we were on the discipline of prayer, the secretness, the sincerity, the simplicity of prayer. And now he moves into the how to. You know, I've met people. I've met people over the years. I'll, I'll be honest with you that have just told me flat out, I don't know how to pray. I, I, I've shared this story before, but I, I remember I hadn't been pastoring here too long, and we were over in the other building, and, and a man came down the aisle, and, and he, he said, I want what you've got. And as we sat down and began to, to counsel uh, about uh, how to be saved and what God can do and, and the freedom that comes from, from knowing Jesus Christ. And I said, you just need to ask Him in your heart. You just need to pray and ask Him in your heart. He said, Brother Jim, I wouldn't even know how to pray. You know, how? How do I pray? And that's exactly what the disciples also desire of Jesus uh, as, we, as we read different places in the New Testament is how do we pray? I've also heard people say, well, uh, Brother Jeff, I'm not good at praying. I'm just not good at that. I just, I, I, I don't, I, I, I can pray and I do pray, but I just don't feel like I can be good at it. Listen, when it comes to prayer, it's not about whether you can or can. It's not about whether you're good or not. It's a, at it or not. It's a matter of the heart. It all comes back to the condition of the heart. And listen, today, as much as you would open your heart up or, or spill your guts, is what we'd say to a close friend of yours, you ought to know that you have the privilege of prayer that you can access the Holy God and that you can open your heart up and whatever it is that is on your heart that you can say to Him because listen to me, He already knows anyway so you might as well just throw up to Him and tell Him what's going on anyway. You might as well tell Him the concerns that you have. You might as well uh, come before Him. Listen, prayer is a privilege just like the, the song that we sang uh, that you can take everything to God in prayer. I'm going to tell you something. That's a problem with the people of the church today uh, at large is the fact that we don't take everything and I mean everything to God in prayer. Everything ought to be taken to God in prayer. But you know what? Here's the thing that we need to know. As much as a friend would listen to us when we spill our guts, the God of heaven, if you are praying, listen friends, He hears you. Psalms 145, 18, the Bible says, The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon Him, to all that call upon Him in truth. <laughs> you know what that tells me uh, right there is that this privilege of, uh, of prayer is easy to access. In other words, that when, when I come before God and that I need to, uh, to, to, to talk to Him, I need to confide in Him, or I need help from Him, that He is easily accessible because it says He is nigh unto all them that call upon Him. He's near. You know, I just don't feel the Lord's presence. Well, sit down and pray. Sit down. Get alone in God. Take what we talked about last time. Get in the discipline of prayer and decide that you're going to get alone with God, that you're going to make that extra effort to be able to be alone with God. And let me tell you something, friends. If you don't feel the presence of God, you will when you sit down and begin to cry out to Him because He says He's near to all those that call on. Amen. So if you want the presence of God to, to abide in your life, take everything to God in prayer. You know, in Jesus, he, he begins to give us this model prayer as it's been termed. 
You know, a lot of people have called it the Lord's Prayer, but I'm going to be honest with you, it's really more, uh, as J. Vernon McGee says, it's, it's really more the disciples' prayer because it's what they need to be praying. These are the things that they were facing on a daily basis. And I'll be honest with you, as I have looked at this model prayer over the years, what it has done for me is it has done a couple of things. One is it reminds me that I am able to engage the God of the universe in my life. That in other words, that even down to my basic needs, that the God of the universe is very much concerned about where I'm at and what I'm going through. Do you hear me? Yeah. Well, nobody cares, you know, but yeah. I can't tell you how many people I've, I've talked to who are going through hard times, and they feel like that nobody cares. Can I just tell you that the God of heaven is very much concerned about where you find yourself at? And Jesus even points that out in this because he takes it all the way down to daily bread in our text today. That your very basic needs, that the God of the universe is very much concerned about your life. But you know what? I also find that this model prayer gives me a roadmap of things that I ought always to pray about. You know, we, we, we obviously could go to God and this is not exhaustive in what Jesus has said here of things that we might bring before God. Uh, because, I mean, it doesn't talk about sick family members. It doesn't talk about things like that. It doesn't talk about financial problems necessarily. It doesn't talk about some of those things. But listen, I want you to hear me, friends. Uh, we can take all these things to God in prayer. And God uh, has given us in this passage a roadmap of things we ought always to pray about. Look at verse 9. Now, let's just, let's just examine what Jesus said. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven... Hallowed be thy name. You know, prayer ours is a privilege. The fact that we can go directly to God, the Father. See, the people that Jesus is talking to here in Matthew chapter 6, they didn't know much about being able to go directly to God. You hear me? They knew a lot about going down to the temple where there was a priest that they had to talk to. They knew a lot about having to go and have somebody else act on their behalf. They knew a whole lot about the fact that there was this big old veil in the temple that, that separated them from the holiest of holies. In other words, it was a place where not only could they not go, but the high priest could only go once a year. You hear me? There was only that one time a year that God would come and sit down in that place uh, and that the high priest would go and make that sacrifice, that yearly ritual uh, sacrifice to God. But see, Jesus Christ, He came and He lived and He died as a sacrifice. And the Bible tells us that when He died that day, that the veil of the temple was torn from top to bottom. Listen, it was torn from top to bottom, I believe, with all my heart to make sure that everybody knew, I mean everybody knew, that God Himself rent that that curtain in that temple. Amen. He tore that veil in two. And He done it through His flesh, the fact that His Son died for our sins. And in dying for our sins, we were given direct access to God. Amen. Direct access to God by Jesus. See, it's because of that that you and I can go, can go to the Lord in prayer. It's because of that that Jesus can teach His disciples that this is the manner to pray. In Hebrews 10 20, it says, By a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. The veil of the temple became the sacrifice of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. The fact that now he is our high priest, he is the one that we can go to. And when we go to him, we are going directly to God. Prayer was different from this point on because Christ was the mediator between man and God, and He was going to reconnect our broken relationship. See, when we pray, folks, we're literally addressing the very God of heaven. Right. You know, hmm. how's your prayer life? How's your prayer life? Let's just get. Let's just get right in there. Let's just get. Let's just get right into each other's house here for a minute. How's your prayer life? Some of you might have to be honest this morning and say, I don't even have one, Brother Jeff. Some of you might say, well, Brother Jeff, I, I just don't feel effective in my prayer life. I just don't see things happening in my prayer life. Some of you might say, oh yeah, well, I talk to God like He's my friend, and that would be great, 
and that would be the answer that we'd be looking for because we should have a friendship with God. But listen, I want you to understand, when you're praying, you're not just talking to the air. You're not just saying something so that you can make yourself feel better. This is not about the power of positive thinking and what you can say out loud that will make you feel better on the inside. I want you to understand, when you call out to a holy God, you're talking to Him, and He hears you. Amen. And He will act. He will act. Jesus says when we pray, we ought to pray and we ought to say, Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed be thy name. And what's he really saying there? Well, hallow something means to make it holy. God's name is to be reverenced. And we don't just reverence God through empty lip service. You can have the best prayer life in the world go out and live like hell in front of the world and I'm going to tell you something. Your prayer life God cannot fellowship with sin. He will not fellowship with darkness. And so it is incumbent upon us to live in a right relationship with God. So you say, yeah, I feel apart from God. And you said, pray. Well, I've been praying, preaching. I don't feel His presence. Well, maybe we ought to confess our sins before a holy God and connect the relationship back to you. Hello? Yeah. See, His name's to be reverenced. And it should be reverenced not just in lip service, but it should be reverenced in our actions. But Jesus is saying when you pray, you ought to uphold the name of God. In other words, we ought to acknowledge that God is higher, that He is greater, that He is holy. Now one thing that Jesus is not saying, Jesus is not saying that you have to start every prayer with, Hallowed be thy name. Our Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. We, we could get real legalistic here. We could, we could get hung up on, on, on what it says and, and miss exactly what He's trying to tell us. You know what? Jesus is not so much concerned with how you reverence the name of God, but that you reverence the name of God. You can pray and say, Lord, I love You and I praise You. You can say, Heavenly Father, Almighty God. You can, you, you can say, Almighty God. You can say, Our Heavenly Father. You can say any number of things to acknowledge that He is here and that we are here. He's so much higher. And it ain't because He's sitting above the clouds and He's up there and we're down here. It ain't about physical. It's about the pureness. It's about the, the fact that He is what we cannot be. And so He had to become what we are so that we could be like Him. Amen. He came down here, wrapped Himself in flesh and died for us so that we could be accepted before Him. Amen. He's so much higher, so much greater, so much purer. He is holy. He is a holy God. See, all that matters is that when we come to God in prayer, that we reverence Him. And then in verse 10, He, he says, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And I mentioned this last week that, you know, as I get older and as I go about time, uh, and as I cultivate my relationship with Jesus, I find that it's not necessary that I need to be told to pray because I know I need to pray. I know I need to pray. The Bible says pray without ceasing. I mean, uh, it says that we ought to, uh, by prayer and supplication, let our request be made known to God. There's so many things in the Bible that command us to pray. Commands us to pray for each other. Commands us to, to, to pray that we'll be uh, kept from the evil. You know, uh, commands us to pray, to pray, to pray. And, and so I, I don't need to learn how, I don't, know, I don't need to be told that I need to pray as much as I need to learn to pray according to the will of God. I need to pray according to the will of God. You know, we're talking about the fact that people's prayer lives may seem ineffective. Listen, it could be that you've got sin in your life and that's broken the fellowship, but it could be that you're not praying for the will of God in your life. You hear me? Could be that you're not praying for the will of God. <laughs> I, I, this much I know is, as I study the Bible and as I go about, I find that the prayers that are answered according to Scripture are those that are prayed according to the will of God. Those who want to get out. You know, uh, you pray for something that's against the will of God, and it's not going to happen. You pray for something that, uh, that's for your own selfish desire and not for the benefit of God and His glory and His kingdom. And it's not going to happen. So, Brother Jeff, what about people getting better when they're sick and things like that? Listen, I, I, I share this as, a, as an example quite often about the fact that we can pray something, and as much as we want it to be that way, uh, it doesn't necessarily happen. We had a dear lady in our church 
several years ago. I haven't been here that long either uh, at the church. And we went and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed for God to heal her. And listen, she still died. And, and, and I, I struggled with that for a long time. God, we prayed for her to be healed. We, we, I mean, we prayed. I prayed until I sweat that day. I had sweat dripping off me when we left. I prayed so hard, and, and, I, and I felt like that I had prayed according to the will of God that, that she be healed, and, and I just couldn't understand it, and, and we got on down the road and uh, from that, you know, several months, and finally God spoke to me and said, what did you ask for me in that situation? I asked for her to be healed. And he said, I did. And I said, what? He said, she's mine. And she's in a place where there is no sickness, sorrow, pain, or death. For the former things have passed away. Listen, I'm here to tell you that there may be a partial healing here on this earth, but I want you to know that there's an eternal healing for those who know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There's a glorified body, and there's a place where sickness will not reach those heavenly shores. Amen. Amen. But the prayers that are answered are the ones that are prayed according to to the will of God. John wrote about it in 1 John 5, 14 and 15 when he said this, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us, and if we know that He hears us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. Man, if I pray according to the will of God, then there is nothing that cannot be done. There is nothing that cannot be be done if it is according to the will of God because God's will will be done. Amen. Jesus said in our passage this morning that we ought to be asking the Lord's will be done. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know, we get the idea a lot of times that prayer is all about us going to God and begging God about things we're concerned about. And no doubt, that is part of prayer. For us to tell God what is on our heart. To, to let our request be made known to God. But I want you to understand something. It's not as much about us going to get our will done in a situation as it is for us to be in a right relationship with God whereby we find ourselves asking for His will in every situation. God, I want Your will for my life. God, I want Your will for my family. God, I want Your will for my church, for my country, for my community. Where, whatever it is that you're praying about. God, I want Your will to be done. Can you imagine what would happen if Christians everywhere just began to pray, God, Thy will be done? And God, whatever it takes, move us aside so that Your will can be done. God, if I've got sin in my life that's pre pre preventing your will from being done in my life, help me to get rid of that sin. If there's something that is blinding me, that is keeping me from getting to you, God, help me to get that thing out of the way so that I can get to your will, God, for my life. What if people everywhere quit praying about, oh, I want my way, and God, this is my will, and started saying, I will be done. I will be done. See, when His will is accomplished on earth, it will benefit the church of God. It will further His kingdom. See, Jesus places the praise of God and asking for His will ahead of anything that we'd ask for ourselves. We haven't even got to anything that's really about us yet. It's all about Him. It's all about Him. As a matter of fact, before we end this sixth chapter... Jesus will pointedly tell us, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. <coughs> things not going well in life? You want something to change? <coughs> Make it a point to seek the kingdom of God first. Make it a point to put God where He needs to be. To make Him priority, number one. To allow everything else to surround Him and for Him to be at the center of everything you do. Listen, you want your life to shape up? You need to put God at the center of it. You need to get focused on Him and what His will is for your life. And He will begin to bring every area of your life together. Oh boy, Brother Jeff, you're saying everything's going to be peachy keen if we just get God in for life. I didn't promise there wouldn't be trouble. I didn't promise that He didn't promise that there wouldn't be times that things would be tough for a child of God. But let me tell you something. When you're in the will of God, when you get to the storm, you're still in a place of peace. Yeah. Huh? Amen, Amen preacher! Hello? <laughs> Repent! I don't know what to say to you this morning. Y'all are setting me like a calf looking at a new gate. <laughs> Huh? What's wrong? We ain't got no prayer line. 
we desire God's will above everything else. He would bring those areas together. But that place of peace that I'm talking about, understand this. I heard him read this in a devotion the other day. I shared it with Michelle and Trina as we were working over at Spring Alive yesterday. I was reading the devotion. And this is what God said, or what the man of God said in that devotion and what God spoke to me about. He said, listen, you know how the disciples were out in the boat that day and the waves got to rocking and carrying on and they thought they were going to die and here comes Jesus walking across the water? This is what this man said. Anything that's over your head is under His feet. Amen. Hello? You're sitting here worrying about things you can't change, you can't control. You're sitting here worrying about things that are not going to be different uh, if you try to change them in your own power. Hear me! It is under His feet! Not because He's up there, but because He's higher and holy and powerful. He's Almighty God! Amen. We have access to Him. Verse 11, it says this, is, Give us this day our daily bread. How many of us, how many of us forget that even down to our basic necessities in life, that it is a holy God that provides them? We get, we get to having trouble. A lot of times we create our own mess as far as our needs go, we get our needs and our wants mixed up, and then we gotta pay for it, right? And then we're sitting there and finances are strapped and we're wondering why everything's going downhill quick and we're sitting here going, oh, if I could just work harder, if I could just do this. Listen, it's because we forgot to go to God about it to begin with and get our priorities in life so that we wouldn't be worried about that. Listen, here's what I want you to understand. God is concerned even down to your basic needs. He's concerned. And Jesus says you ought to pray for those. You ought to realize you can't work harder. You can't do more. You can't get more and fix it. You need to say and acknowledge where it originates from. And that is from the hand of God. That's where our basic needs even come from. Paul said in Philippians 4.19, he said, But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm just going to go sit down and wait for the Lord to take care of it, Jim Brother Jim. Hey, listen, you got the job you got because He gave it to you. You have the food on your table because He provided it. He did create the world, you know. I mean, if you really want to think about it, we're sitting in a nice church building, right? but yet everything that's here is made up of things that He created. Because of what He did, we have the ability to have what we have. The car you drive, the house you live in, the job you go to. Now, all those things are happening because God has permitted those things to be. Listen, everything comes from Him. If you got up this morning, you drew your breath this morning, and were able to go again today because the God of heaven permitted it to be. Jesus is saying we ought to acknowledge that what we have comes from God and we ought to ask Him daily, I need your help. I need your help to provide. I need you to sustain me. One preacher said it is that Christians have to live from hand to mouth. That's it. They get no more. From hand to mouth. God, just help me to get by today. Just sustain me for what's ahead. See, Jesus had already said in verse 8 in chapter 6, He said that the Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. So what's the point of prayer, Brother Jeff? Why do we keep doing that? And I gave you an illustration. I know my kids' wants and needs. And so guess what? I still like for them to tell me. Jesus, uh, Jesus is telling us that even though God already knows, that we should acknowledge what He has done for us and what He gives us. In verse 12 of Matthew chapter 6, he says, and Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, I've heard people pray the Lord's Prayer a multitude of ways and everything, but, but I, they always either say, Forgive us our debts or forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. So you know what? Whether it's debts or whether it's trespasses, the end result is this. Sin. Lord God, forgive us of our You know, if there's one thing that we ought always to do in our prayers, we ought to find a place of time. Because I'm not perfect. I don't claim to be. You're not.
not first, you know you're not, no, I'm not, right? We're, we're a fallen people. We live a fallen world. And so we ought to always repeat. You know, one of the things that, that God taught me about this, though, is, is, is this right here. A lot of times we want to pray. If you do this, uh, change it. How you do it tonight, okay? <laughs> If you're one of these people who come to God that your idea of repentance is, oh God, forgive us of all our sins. Forgive me of all my sins. Forgive me of all my sins. That's our idea of repentance. Listen, sin is specific. If I'm a liar, I lie, right? If I've stolen, I'm a thief. If I've slept with another man's wife, I'm an adulterer. You know, let us. Walk down this line here a minute, right? So no matter what I've done, then I'm guilty, and I'm guilty of something specific. And so if I'm guilty of something specific, then when I go to God, it should not be, oh God, I really don't want to tell you what I've done, so I'll just say, Lord, just forgive me of my sins. It ought to be, God, this is what I am. Yeah. You say, oh, but Jeff, I don't, I don't think we have to be that specific. I don't think it's that important. Well, can I just tell you that, that we don't go apologize for being a thief when we lie? Hello? We don't go apologize for the different crime than what we committed. They don't punish you for a different crime. You don't, you don't steal something and they put you to death for murder. Hello? They punish the crime that was committed. And so... If sin is specific, then we ought to be specific when we talk to God. And we ought to acknowledge the area that we have fallen short of the glory of God. And say, well, Jeff, there's times that we just don't know. You know what our prayer ought to be? God, forgive me of this, this, and this, because this is what I know I've done. And God, if there's something that I didn't realize I've done, would you please bring it to my heart and mind so that I can confess that, so that our relationship can be whole, so that our relationship can be right. See, just as much as you have to confess that you sin and fall short of the glory of God to be saved, and I have to confess that I sin and fall short of the glory of God to be saved, we still have to go to God on a daily basis and say, God, I am a sinner. You say, why? So, so that we can maintain our salvation? No. Because we broke His heart. We broke His, we broke His, uh, his fellowship with us. And we want that fellowship to maintain and to, uh, if it's been broken to be restored. But you know, He didn't just focus. Jesus didn't just say, oh, forgive us our debts. He says as we forgive our debtors in verse 12 there. And so that's why in verses 14 and 15 of, of Matthew chapter 6 that Jesus addresses the need to forgive others. He says, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. As we mentioned in chapter 5, Jesus, is, Jesus talked about this a little bit in chapter 5. And he's talking to His followers. And His followers have been shown grace and we're to offer the same thing. And it's not about salvation here. I mean, you don't, it's like, oh, well, I, I can't come to God because I'm holding this grudge against somebody. Listen, you can come to God and be saved. And, and, and have a whole lot of sin and a whole lot of problems and a whole lot of muck and mire that you're bringing to God's feet and saying, I have messed this all up and I'm just going to have to put my faith and trust in you to change me and to, and, and to do this in my life. Now when you get saved, God may send you to some people that you have a broken relationship with and say, get this thing fixed. Go confess that you wronged them. Go confess that God has changed you and let them know how different you are. But listen, when it comes to this passage right here, this is not about salvation. This is still about fellowship. It's all about fellowship. Talking with God is a matter of fellowship with God. Then we find in verse 13 that he says this. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. <laughs> There's a battle going on, folks. There's a battle going on between God and the devil, between good and evil, between heaven and hell, between us. And, the, and, and, and the, the one who would seek to oppress us in our walk, and that is the devil himself. And so we need to understand that there's a constant battle happening. 
And so, you know what? Here's the thing. We're having to come back to God and back to God and back to God to ask Him to restore our fellowship because of our sins. But listen, that is because we are constantly being tempted. And really, literally, what this passage is trying to tell you and I is that we need to ask God to have such control over our lives that we are led away from temptation and not into temptation. Now, if we get led into temptation, who's going to take this thing? Not God. God don't tempt people. God don't tempt people. The devil does. The Bible tells us to beware of the wiles of the devil. You could replace that word wiles with schemes and scams. Beware of the schemes and the scams of the devil. The devil will try to lead you down a slippery slope. He'll try to take you places you never intended to go, do things you never intended to do. See, we need to desire God's control over our lives so much so that we head in the opposite direction from temptation. I'll be quite honest with you. This has become, for me, as I walk with God, one of the most important parts of praying every day. And it's that time of saying, God, I need you to help me be aware of what the devil is trying to use against me today. I need you to help me be aware, to keep my mind and heart fixed on you and to not be distracted by the cares of this world or by the scams that the devil try to pull. You know what I really believe, and, and, and we could go a lot of different routes with the last three verses here in, in Matthew chapter 6, but I believe that the reason that Jesus teaches on fasting right after He finishes His discourse on prayer is because there are going to be times in your life and times in my life when we're going to need to fast. We're going to need to fast because, listen, there's going to be times when the battle is going to be tough. There's going to be times when we're walking with God that it's going to get, uh, it, it's going to get pretty intense. These battles are if we're really living for God. And it may be that we see the battle ahead of time and we say, God, I see what's on the horizon. I see an area of spiritual need in my life. And so I'm going to humble myself and fast. But what is biblical fasting? It's abstaining from food for a period of time. And dedicating yourself to God, man. Right? Well, is that the only way you can fast? Well, no, I mean, some people aren't medically able to fast from food. You know, it might be that, guess what? Uh, one, of, uh, uh, one of your problems that is keeping you from being able to focus on God and be able to hear from God is the fact that you're constantly on an electronic device, be it a cell phone, be it an iPad, iPod, iThingy, whatever. Hello? I don't know what all the but you're constantly on that device and that device constantly has your attention. I mean, folks, I know a lot of us use them for, for our Bible and our church, but some of us can't even get to church without being distracted by them. Do you hear me? They're a distraction. And they distract us from hearing from God because our focus is somewhere other than God. And listen, you might even need to fast from those things for a little while and get along with God and say, God, I'm dying spiritually here. I'm in the midst of a spiritual drought. And so I'm going to set aside these things. This television is not going to get my attention. This computer is not going to get my attention. This cell phone, this iPod, whatever uh, thing it is that's got our attention is not going to have my attention. But God, you have my attention. Amen. I'm here. I'm praying. I'm right here. I want to hear from you. There's going to be times that you're going to need that. You're going to be, and you might even get in the midst of the battle and feel you're about to go under. But listen, God will come to you. God will rescue you. And it might be that God convicts you to fast as a cry out to God. Jesus says if you're going to do it, do it in secret. Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18 says, Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear in the men to fast. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. That thou wilt not fast as anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which sitteth in secret shall reward thee openly. Jesus says, You'll be rewarded. But He says, don't do it where everybody knows it's going on. You know, we're about to go into a time of prayer and fasting here in, in less than a month. 
And it's going to go on for 40 days. We ain't going to be out here going, oh, I'm fasting from electronics. Or, oh, I'm fasting from food. Or, I'm fasting from cheeseburgers. You know? That's not, we're not going to be doing that. Whatever you're doing, you're going to be doing it in secret. We know everybody in the church is supposed to be doing it, but we're, we're, we're not going to be talking about it. And we're not going to come to church and go, oh, I've been three months and I've had a cheeseburger. I've not been in the, I've not been in the burger joint since the 12th of March. You know what Jesus is telling us in this passage about fasting? You can get hung up on what fasting is and how it works, but listen to it. Get this. This is what Jesus is teaching us. And He tried to teach us this about giving, about prayer, and about fasting. God does not reward showmanship. God rewards. You don't get nothing else. Not anything I've said to this. God does not reward showmanship. He rewards See, the Bible teaches that if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that's why we need to take everything from God. Because it's under His mighty hand that we place ourselves when we go to God in prayer. That's why Jesus wanted His disciples to know how to pray. It's why the disciples desired to know how to pray. It's because they knew that they would be putting themselves under the mighty hand. And if you put yourself under His mighty hand, He's in control. Not just of one thing, but of everything in your life. See, God honors you. And so Jesus ends this model prayer in verse 13 with saying, For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. With one final acknowledgement that, hey, listen to me, God. Listen to me. I want you to know, God, you're so much higher than me. You're so much more worthy. You're so much more holy. He is. We sing a lot of songs about worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Oh man, listen. One day, the voices of all those who know that to be true will collectively cry. Word. 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 And in the same chorus, will cry, Holy. Holy. He's holy. He's worthy of our praise. We should consider the privilege that the God of heaven is that concerned that He wants us Heads are bowed and eyes